You, you understand? So looks are very important. I want to talk about this. So I need everybody to yell this as loud as you can because when you yell this, it's going to get down in your spirit and your psyche. Say, do something, do something. About, it. about it. Now let's make it personal. Say, I am, I am. Doing, something doing something about this. About now I need you to look at who's next to you and look at them in their face and tell them, do something, do something. about it. We're going to do something about it. So let's get, a, let's get a biblical base for this thing first. A biblical base for this. Let's go. Y'all ready to go? Let's go. Biblical base. I want you to turn, if you have it, if not, they'll put it on the screen to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, verse number 19. I want to show you in Scripture first how God feels about how we look and how we handle our bodies. All right? Y'all ready to go? It says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God. You're not your own. Verse 20, you're bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Your body is the temple that the Holy Spirit lives in. You know, God dwelt in the, 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 the Mosaic tabernacle and the tabernacle of Solomon. And so the, the Holy Spirit truly lived in those places. Just like now, he lives in the lives of the believer. Now, let's look at this thing theologically. Let's look at it first of all. But, uh, Old Testament, before Jesus came and died on the cross, um, they would carry him around in what's called the Ark of the Covenant. He would, they would have tabernacles where the Spirit of God will descend from heaven, come down and worship. When people go home, he'll go back to heaven. Amen. They carried him around called the Ark of the Covenant, and that's where God dwelt. Wherever the Ark of the Covenant was, was symbolic of where the Spirit of God was. If, if the Ark of the Covenant wasn't in the town, the Spirit of God wasn't in the town. Everybody say Old Testament. Old Testament. New Testament, Jesus dies on the cross. When he dies on the cross, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. In other words, what, was, what used to be necessary when Jesus came and died on the cross, now he says it's unnecessary. So now Jesus says, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm dying on the cross. I'm coming back in three days, but when I come back, I'm going to leave you a gift. Everybody say, what gift? What gift? The Holy Spirit. He, get, he left the gift of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. So now the Holy Spirit is always in the world. He don't have to go up and down. He's always here, and he lives on the inside of each and every true Christian believer. Amen. The Holy Spirit lives in us. Amen. We don't own our bodies. God owns them. We are only stewards of what God has lent us to use. Does it make sense? Have you ever let somebody borrow your car? And you said, this is my car, dog, and I'm going to let you use it. And in my car, I don't want nobody smoking my car, and I don't want nobody eating chili dogs in my car. You can drive my car all week, but I'm letting you use my car. You handle my car a certain way. It's my car that I'm allowing you to use. What happens if you get your car back and they have smoked Black and Miles, Newports, and ate chili dogs and left stains on your seats and trash in your car? How would you feel? You would be upset. Now, I like cars a lot, but I'm not car crazy. Some people see scratches and stuff like that don't, don't really mess me up, but some people will hurt you about that car. Some of y'all, that's me, that's me. Some of y'all in here. You'll hurt somebody. You dent, you, 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 you dent that car. You do something wrong. You got people who will fight you over that car. Same thing. God says your body don't belong to you, but it belongs to me. It belongs to God. So we don't have the right to do whatever we want to do with our bodies. So why is what I'm talking about so important in relationships and in, 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 the, in the church world and in life? Because first of all, your body don't belong to you. So you don't have the right to handle it any kind of way. Isn't that something? Watch this. If Jesus, if Jesus knocked on your door, if you was at the house one day and you heard a knock, do, 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 you said, hello. Nobody said nothing. They knocked again. Do, 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 do. You say, hello. Who is it? Jesus. Jesus? <laughs> Jesus came to your crib and said, listen, tomorrow I need to come. I'm in the world. I don't want nobody to know. I'm walking around, but I picked your house to stay in. I, tomorrow I'll be back at one. I need to sleep at your crib. What, what, what room would you put Jesus in? The creator of the universe. Would you put Jesus in the dirty room? Would you put Jesus in the room where, where, where the toilet is nasty and the bed is nasty and you got, you got stuff 
uh, swept all under the rug. You got hamburger pack packages and all kind of stuff. But you put Jesus in the dirty room? No, you wouldn't. You know why? Because you know he's Jesus. So the same thing with our bodies. God says, I want to live in you. The Spirit of God says, I want to live in you, but I want, you to, I, want, I want your body to function right. So we have to have a mindset, first of all, of what we want to do in our relationships. Secondary, first, we want to have an have a ad, ad, ad attitude based on how God feels. See, when I don't care how you feel, on a horizontal level, I care how God feels. If, if, when I don't care how you think I look, on a horizontal level, how I'm carrying myself, when I don't care, I need to care about how he feels because he's the manufacturer, he's the owner, he's the inventor, he's the designer, he's God. You understand? It's a mindset. It's an it's a attitude. You know, so our body is a house for the Holy Spirit and he wants everything to work properly. God's lent us our bodies. He's the owner. He wants us to be a good steward over them. A good steward. First, see, a, a kingdom paradigm is a person that don't think like regular people. A man that has a kingdom mindset don't think like every other man. A, a, a woman that has a kingdom mindset, she don't think and handle things like any other woman does. She thinks about it different. She considers the kingdom. She considers the importance of how God feels about this. So she's really not going to make these, these decisions solely on how you feel. She's really making them on how God feels. Because none of this stuff will work if you don't do it for you. See, I invented this term called selfish righteousness. Some of this stuff has got to be all about you, not your spouse, not, 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 not the person that you're dating. It's really got to be about you and God first. See, see, kingdom men don't make choices about their wife and their families based on how they feel necessarily. They make them based on how God feels first. Because when I don't care how you feel, some of y'all just looking crazy. Don't act like you don't some days you can care less of how your spouse feel. You'd be like, whatever, I don't care. I don't like you today. But when you really care about how God feels, now it adjusts how you act, what you do. Who says short is what's good looking? Who made the rules? Where do we derive our rules from? Come on, single people, where do we get them from? Married people, where do we get them from? God certainly didn't give the rules because he made everybody all kind of ways. He made some people tall, some people short, some people heavy, some people light, some people dark, some people light. He made people all kind of ways. And he thinks all of them are beautiful. So, so, first of all, we must derive our mentality and our, the way we think and feel about life and relationships and beauty and how we look from God first for us first. Does that make sense? From God first and for us first. Why does God want us to be healthy and do well? To advance the kingdom. It's bigger than just you and me. It's bigger than just your family. He wants the kingdom to be advanced. You're that important. He wants you to live as long as you can because he wants you, you're that important to God to advance the kingdom by how we live and what we do. But if we're not healthy, if we're not healthy mentally, if we're not healthy physically, and it's our, it's our own doing, how do we fix that? How do we, how do we, how do we calculate that? So, my first point I want to say is, you got to do this for yourself and nobody else. If you don't make this decision for you, it won't last. You can't make this decision just for your spouse. <coughs> you can't make this decision to look better and to be healthier and to do better just for your spouse because it won't last. It's not enough. Your spouse is not enough. I'm telling you, they're not enough. You got to do this for you. Some of you, I've been seeing on Facebook and all this, I'm going to the gym, I heard the message on looks, pastor say do something about it, but if you're not doing it for you, because you get it, it won't last. So the same problem you and your husband is having about how you look, or you and your wife are having about how you look, they'll be right back in 30 days. Because you didn't do it for you. You did it for somebody else. Fragmented people do things depending on what everybody else say. 
If you're single, get this first. You can't make choices about your life based on how everybody else feels. Because some people are going to have something to say no matter what you do. No matter what you do. So I even had to learn for myself, there are certain choices I'm making for myself, and if you don't like it, I don't need you in my life. Because, because some people are going to find an issue with everything. So I've got to make this decision based on me. Watch this. It's going to mess some of y'all up and not even my spouse. I want to look good for me. For me. For me. Even if you're single and you're just dating, even if you're by yourself, you got to do this stuff for you first. You, listen, if you're a single chick, you need to get up, get your hair done, get your nails done, look good, go to the gym, work out, be fine. Not for a man. You ought to do it for you. And when you do it for you, then you're going to start attracting a whole nother level of men. Because they're going to smell something about you that's different than everybody else. Because they're going to know when they run up on you, they can't handle you like any fragmented chick. They have ran up on a chick who happen to know who she is. Woo! And the game has just changed. See, what, what single ladies always say, why is it so hard to get a guy? And then you see this woman that you think ugly have turned three marriage proposals down and married this guy who looked like the man in your dreams, but you can't tell her she ain't fine. <laughs> you can't tell her. You can't, have you ever met a person and they be talking about how, how they feel? Sometimes people can go over the top, how good they look, and you be looking at them saying, do they realize? <laughs> And she be saying, or he be saying, what's he finna do and what's gonna happen? And you be like, what? And then you look around and what they said was gonna happen, happen. And who be looking like Boo Boo the Fool? You. So you gotta know who you are internally first. All of us have insecurities. But if we don't manage those insecurities properly, they bleed over into all of our relationships. So now we're insecure. See, you can be a man that's insecure about yourself and your wife never thought about that. And every day you talking about how you look or what don't what ain't right. And before you know it, she started seeing it and agreeing. <laughs> At first she liked it. And now you you have made her not like it. Amen. Some of you ladies, you got to get secure. Stop being intimidated by another beautiful lady that come in and be, oh, she thinks she's fine. I wasn't even looking at her until you said it. Lord, have mercy. <laughs> <laughs> Good googly moogly. Wasn't paying her no attention. She think her hair pretty. It is flowing. <laughs> and then we cause problems in our relationship. Now we got issues because we're insecure. And we hadn't, de we hadn't uh, derived our worth from him. He says you're beautifully and wonderfully made. In your mother's womb, it's like he hand-stitched you. Whew. It's like he took a needle and thread, the commentary said, and knitted you together. You are like a snowflake. Every snowflake has a, has a certain design. It's unique. Every single snowflake, there's no two snowflakes alike. You have a beauty. You have a beauty. You have a goodness. I'm talking to men, too, and I ain't talking about no sweet stuff, gentlemen. Don't get me twisted. I will swing on you and still preach. I promise you. I promise you I will. And be preaching like I ain't even hit you. I promise but even men, we have a beauty in us. Fearfully and wonderfully made. Guys have insecurities too. Single guys, tell the truth. I know you can't because it's not, it's not cool, but I'm going to say it for you. Tell the truth. We have insecurities too. If you're single, you worry about how you look. Oh, am I good enough? Do I look? And you, you done walked up and was so lame to this girl. She, she thought she was tight until you started talking. When you started talking, she saw your soul. She thought you was all that until you start running your mouth about everything and all the words that you're saying are not the words that say, but behind the words you're saying, I'm insecure. You're saying stuff like, well, you know, how you doing today? Well, you know, it's okay. You just said you're insecure. Well, how was work? Well, you know, you just said you don't like your job. Well, how's things going? Oh, uh, well, negative, 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 negative. 
And ladies feed on strength from a man more than how you look. You could be ugly and walk up on a crazy. Give me your number, I'm gonna bust you in your head. <laughs> Gotta walk up on a dog and tell him. What's wrong with him? I want your number. <laughs> She's gonna be like, 770. No. He crazy, but I like that. You know what? Because you derived your swag from who? So you got to start figuring out who, who made me, man. Who made, why did he make me this height? Why did he make me like this? I, listen, everybody have them. I, sometimes I say, look, and we look at all the people. Look, look at how we're growing. We, this is our third time. We're going to have to build something else. We're outgrowing this again. Guys, continue. We're going to have so many mother people coming. But every time I look on TV, every time I, I watch other pastors, I say, ain't nobody like me. I, I, I'm weird, I guess. I'm trying to find. I look at Osteen. He said, hey, friends. I look at the other people, and they say other stuff. And I'm looking at me saying, wow, that's just, okay, God, I'm going to just go with how you made me. I, I, why do I talk like, why do I say this? <laughs> I was talking to, a, I was talking to a, 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 another pastor friend, and I said, maybe something is wrong with me because I, I won't be happy until our church is more multicultural and every week is getting more. I'm pissed. I, I used to be up here, th what, I'm 34 now, 32, 33, rolling church and mad. Y'all didn't even know I'm pissed off. I'm preaching and it's packed out. We knocking walls down and I'm inside, I'm crying. This ain't what God showed me. <laughs> what am I saying? But I tap into him and say, God, hey, this is how you make it. And if you don't like it, I don't like you either. <laughs> how does a person become whole after years of being a fragment? This you want to know, right? Fragmented if you're single. Some of y'all single. Let me tell you why. You've been single so long. Because you hold, you have. And because you're a fragment, every time you try to connect with somebody, if they are fragmented, it don't fit. That's what it looked like. When you're a fragment, you're trying to connect with somebody and it don't fit. When you whole. See, when you can become whole as a man, and when you can really become whole as a woman, then it's easy to connect. It's easy to connect because you're whole. Fragments don't work like that. When it comes to relationships, you got to be whole all the way first. So how does a person become whole if you've been a fragment for all these years? Here we go, y'all. Let's roll. First of all, I said you got to learn about who made you. Second of all, you got to get to know him in a personal experience. Amen. You got to get to know God in a personal experience, like coming to church and worshiping. That's why I took 10 extra minutes to push us to worship. Because if we can worship him, he'll, in worship, he begins to tell us things about us we didn't realize. He'll tell you things about what you need to do better in your marriage. Amen. He'll put it in my mouth, even when you listen. He'll make it come out in a way, and you'll think, did he know? Honey, did you call the pastor? No. No. It got, God began to speak it to you. Because you got to know him in a personal way. Here's the, th here's the next one. You got to get rid of anything that stunts your growth. Anything that stunts your growth, you got to get away from them. Or you got to get it out of your life. You got to get certain people out of your life. You got to get it away from you. You got to stop listening to the same things. You got to stop going to the same places. You got to stop talking to the same people. You got to quit eating the same stuff. Do you know, listen, I went from a six pack to a two pack to a fat pack. Now I'm trying to get a six pack again and I think I found two of them over on the corner over here. I had to get rid of things that's hindering me. I love to snack late. At 11 o'clock at night, I would eat a whole bag of Doritos, a whole bag of white popcorn, cheddar popcorn. And then go downstairs and back and forth, back and forth, and get chocolate donuts and eat the little, you know them little donuts? You can't, it don't work. You got to get rid of it. You got to get rid of things. You got to get rid of people. If you're single, who keep talking to you with this weak, foolish stuff like you can't ever get a woman? Or you can't ever, there ain't no good men left. Shut your mouth. Yeah. Ain't no, it ain't no more good women. All of them crazy. That is a lie. Yeah. <laughs> so you got to get rid of anything that hinders you. Here's the next one. You got to, you can't listen to people that don't have an investment in you. That's the best way to mess your marriage up. Talk to people who don't have an investment. 
here's the scenario. You at work, you know, my wife keeps talking to me about how I look, man, and I just, it's bothering me. Man, whatever, dog. These other bras think you hot. <laughs> you know, whatever, man. Just do your thing. You the man. You wear the pants. No, get rid of that. No, go to the gym. Get a haircut. I know, I know what some people say, because I'm young. Well, we see what you do when you're about 50, son. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to do what the 50 year olds in the gym do. Work out. <laughs> it's 50-year-old guys in the gym, 60-year-old guys in the gym with grays in their, in their beards and gray in their hair, and their arms look like I want mine to look. I see, I see women in that gym. I have seen ladies come in that gym and lose 50 pounds and tone everything up. Tone it up, round it out, everything. <laughs> Some of y'all want to be rounder. Just I see them get on that squat machine and round it out. <laughs> Look at somebody and say, no more! no more! Excuses. So let me give you some practical stuff. Let's get practical. Watch this. Here's something if you're married or if you're dating. When I say partner, please don't get confused in this series. When I say partner, I don't mean partner like our times say partner. When I say partner, I believe in male and female. Does that make sense? Adam and Eve. Not Adam and uh, Steve, I guess. That's so nasty. Just even think that. To say it. And I don't care if you don't like it. I'm talking about a man and a woman. <laughs> We don't want to be confused no more. You're a man. <laughs> all, of us have, all of us have propensities to do things because the devil is real. Understand people, homosexual appetites and all that kind of stuff comes because the enemy send it. You don't have to give in to it, okay? And I don't care if you don't like it. All right? If your partner tells you that you're beautiful or handsome, Believe them. If your husband or your wife or your boyfriend or girlfriend tell you that you are beautiful or you're handsome, believe them. They're the most important. Believe them when they tell you that. Believe them. It is my job as, my, as a husband to uh, affirm my wife in every area in her life. And she needs to believe. If I think she's beautiful, she needs to say, I'm beautiful. If she says, I'm handsome, I need to believe I'm handsome. Do you understand? You believe it. A lot of, a lot of people have problems in their marriages and their relationships because they don't believe the other person. Amen. Your husband telling you he loves you. He telling you he loves you. He telling you you're beautiful. He telling you you're sexy. She telling you he, she's attractive to you. Uh, she's attracted to you. But if you don't believe her, there's a problem. So let me help you. If your husband or your wife tell you you're attracted to them, believe them. Believe them. Listen, if you haven't told your partner in a while that they're attracted to you, you should. Because there's a mental component to a relationship working that comes from the partner. Makes sense. Watch this. So what if you know they're lying? <laughs> if you know they're lying, believe them, and then you tell yourself the truth. <laughs> Well, show what I'm saying. Well, I'm glad you think I'm sexy, and that means everything because you're my spouse, but there's still things about me I don't like for myself. You keep that part to yourself and do something about it. Right. You, see, you see how I'm trying to show you? I'm, I'm running out of time. You see how I'm trying to show you? You got the vertical, and then you got horizontal. See, I got to get my stuff from God, and it's all about me. And then there's a part that's cut off here, and it's all about me and you. You and her. You and him. That affirmation, God ain't going to do that part because it's the husband's job. God's not going to do that part. It's the wife's job. And he's not going to do that part. It's your job. So if they're lying, then you believe them. Believe they really feel like that and, and appreciate it and let that give you some strength. But still get in the mirror and tell yourself the truth. Here's the next one. You become whole when you admit to yourself the truth about you. Here's the last one. Do something about it if you, if you can. But watch this. If you can't, don't worry about it. 
Because you fill in the security gap where nothing can physically be done. You do it for the partner mentally. Let me show you. Some of us have had surgeries. We've had sicknesses. We have all kind of things. Listen, if you can't do something about the scar, forget about it. If you can't do something about whatever, if you had medication or whatever happened, forget about it. Spouse, you affirm that area. Does that make sense? Some men think scars are sexy. Some women think scars are sexy. So if, if you have something you can't do anything about, don't worry about it. 